Hi, in today's video, I am going to talk about how to decide on how many bins do we want to have using LN2 patch flatten. In the previous video, you can remember that we were using U and V coordinates computed by LN2 multilater rate together with the depth coordinate computed by LN2 layers to do the transformation from the folded brain to a flat representation by using LN2 patch flatten. And you can remember that we had an example which we have used 20 by 20 pins to represent the cortical surface and 11 depths. So here I would like to expand upon this decision because this is a very important visualization decision. You can remember that in the original curvature bind data we only had ones and twos. One denoting salsi and two denoting gyri. However, in the flat representation that we have acquired by using LN2 patch flatten, now we ended up having some numbers in between 1 and 2, especially in the transition parts. So why did this happen? To explain that, I would like to show you an extra output of LN2 patch flatten. Here, I am using the LN2 patch flatten program with the curvature bint values and the other inputs as mentioned in the previous video. But the important part that we are talking about today is this part, where we determine the number of bins. However, now recognize that we have a new parameter here, which is called density. Now let's see what it will compute. It is finished. Now let's inspect our file again. Here you can see my values nifty transformed into a flat patch. And here you can see an extra output called density. Let's load it. In this density image, what you are seeing, you can read the number here, is the number of folded brain voxels that fall into this exact bin in the flat representation. And you can see that this number varies. This is expected because you cannot change the curvature of an object without making some parts of it denser or sparser. You can see that, for instance, in the sulcus part, in the deep regions of the gray matter, we have a very dense sampling. However, in the superficial parts of the cortex, we have a more sparse sampling. You can see that the density values are decreasing from tens. In the deep regions, they increase to 50s. And in the middle of the gray matter, they should be more or less homogeneous. You can imagine that if you peel an orange and if you press it down to a table, some parts will crack where the other parts will get denser. So this is a similar phenomenon happening, only that we don't have any cracking or tearing apart in this program. From this density representation of our flat cortical brain chunk, what we need to inspect or decide on is that how sparse or dense we want this flat cortical brain chunk to be. For instance, this is a very dense flat cortical brain, brain chunk. And let's see what will happen when I increase the number of bins. For instance, here I'm going to now use 50 bins for U, 50 bins for V. And I will keep the depth the same, 11 bins. Okay, it is finished. Let's have a look at the result. So now you can see that on the X and Y axis in this flat representation, instead of 20, I have 50 bins. The transition parts of my bin curvature become a bit more sharper, less blurry. Let's have a look at the density file. Here you can see that the densities overall has decreased from around 30s plus minus 15 to 10s in the middle gray matter. Of course, when you go to superficial or the deep gray matter, the local densities of how many folded brain voxels fall into the same flat brain bin or voxel will change depending on the curvature. This is expected. Now, let's push this example to its extreme. And for instance, let's use instead of 50, 500 U and V bins. And also maybe let's make 101 depth bins. The operation has finished. I'm loading the file. In this 500 by 500 to 101 depth flat representation of the folded brain, now we end up seeing an 
interesting pattern so what is going on here you can see that we have so many bins in x and y of the flat representation we do not have anymore the condition where multiple folded brain voxels fall into the same flat representation bin or voxel we can zoom in each of these dots are exactly the information coming from a single folded brain voxel and i can check this by checking the density file in the density file you will see that almost all of these dots are labeled with one which means that there is only one voxel falling into that bin and there are actually zero voxels that fall exactly to this u v and d combination in the flat representation some of you might think that this can be a problem however we can solve sparsity problem easily by using a simple interpolation method for instance for each black voxel in this flat representation we can use nearest neighbor interpolation so that whichever is the nearest voxel to this empty voxel here will inherit the value of the filled in voxel this simple interpolation method is implemented in ln2 patch flatten all you need to do is to add an extra parameter called Voronoi now let's run it and see what will happen it is finished let's inspect the results now you can see that I have an extra output called Voronoi and if I load it you will see that now the empty bins are filled in with an interpolation now let's compare it to the old version where we see the voxels sparse just to summarize today i have showed you the decisions of the final flat cortical chunk that we want to have in terms of being dense or sparse when we think about the folded brain voxels falling into the bins in our flat representation i don't think there is a best approach here it depends on what you are trying to do you might choose dense resampling or dense transformation as i showed before with this 20 by 20 example or a sparse flattening which puts many more voxels than you have available in the folded brain voxels into the flat domain and then you solve the empty voxels problem by interpolating in between just for visualization hope this was informative thanks for listening